When you think of witchcraft, what do you see? Do you picture an old woman wearing a black cloak, crouching over her boiling cauldron? As you'll discover throughout this series on witchcraft and deliverance, witchcraft is real, but it's different from how Hollywood portrays it. Today, I'm talking with Andy Sanders about how witchcraft can sneak into the church and how to wage spiritual warfare against it. And on the phone today, I have Andy Sanders. He's a speaker and a writer, and he has a prophetic and leadership message for the church. If perhaps you've heard of him because he writes for our online magazine, charismamag.com. So Andy, do you want to say hi to our guests and maybe tell us a little bit about yourself? Oh, absolutely. Thank you for letting me be with you here today. Um, yeah, I've been preaching and teaching for 26 years and uh, also been writing 20 years. And I came out of a really, really bad background prior to salvation. And um, the Lord has helped me over the years uh, free people from coming out of some of these same backgrounds, which we'll be talking about today. Very nice. I'm excited for it. We're going to talk about witchcraft in the church. So... Andy, let me just start by asking you, have you ever personally witnessed or experienced witchcraft coming against you? Oh, absolutely. For me, it started when I was a child. Um, because of what my family had dabbled into years ago before I was even born, uh, it was a generational thing. And uh, when I was a child, I used to have demons actually wake me up at my the foot of my bed, and they would taunt me, try to choke me, and things like that. Oh, my goodness. And, uh, what I, yeah. In fact, to make a long story really short... When I became born again, I heard another evangelist share a very similar story about how this specific demon would come and visit him every once in a while and would choke him out and and scare the daylights out of him. And one day when he became born again, he screamed at it and said, in the name of Jesus, I command you to go. So I did the exact same thing after I became born again. And that demonic force actually left and never came back. Wow. And so that was that was my first encounter. And um, as I also was a children's pastor, youth pastor, associate pastor, senior pastor, um, we had also dealt with some people on staff that were demon possessed and unfortunately involved with witchcraft. And we dealt with some people that were coming into our church that were uh, playing with witchcraft. I guess I'd say that word cautiously because playing with witchcraft is like playing with fire right wow and how old were you when you finally told that demon to leave uh the demon started i noticed the demon was tormenting me from the time i was around six years old that i can remember all the way up till the time i gave my heart to the lord when i was 18 years old okay. when i heard the evangelist tell me the exact same story that was around 18 years old when i pointed my finger to that demon and told to leave it never came back since wow so it harassed you for that long Yes, when it would come into the room, it would actually make itself known so powerfully that it would wake me up and it would stand at the foot of my bed. It wouldn't necessarily extend its arms to choke me, but it would choke me out. I would actually stop breathing, and sometimes I thought I was actually going to choke to death. Now, were you? could you not breathe out of fear, or did you feel like the demon was exerting its power to choke you? I think sometimes it was a mix of both. You know, I have discovered that demons like to show off, and hmm. they like to taunt themselves. I think it was a mix of both sometimes. Interesting. Did it ever say anything to you? Nope. Never heard it say a word. Wow. It just liked to show off and make itself known. And what was interesting, I would sleep in pitch black, and I would see this thing in the pitch black darkness of the night. It would still be there. Interesting. But when you claimed the power of the blood of Jesus, it just left? <laughs> yes. Uh, yes, uh, it took me a while to get the power of the blood of Jesus out of my mouth that day, but when I yelled it and pointed my finger and said, don't ever come back, it actually twirled and left, and it, yeah, I've never seen it since. So I believe it was a generational bloodline curse, a work that had been put into our bloodline from all of the things that my previous generation had done, which was very, very evil prior wow. to my salvation. Now, forgive me if this is a little too personal, but do you mind me asking, what was your family involved in? Well, there were a couple things. My family... Uh, number one was involved in just the basic whoremonging, uh, you know, whoremonger life of living in and out of the factories. And every weekend they would go look for trouble. And so they didn't have to look too hard because they would always find it. And so they were always involved with the drunkenness, the drugs, sleeping around, going in and out of jail. They were a lot of thieves in my bloodline. But my bloodline was also involved with the mafia. And oh, wow. with that, they did some pretty 
bad things. And those things tied together, uh, specifically dabbling. A lot of my generation played with witchcraft. They played with the Ouija boards and they got involved with those things. And that's what opens the doors to all that stuff. Man, that is such a good point. Now, you also mentioned you witnessed witchcraft in your church experience. So can you give me an example of a time when you had to deal with witchcraft in a church? And what happened? Uh, yeah, I could give you two brief ones, if you don't mind. One yeah. of them was uh, a man came in posing to be a minister, and he came in the door uh, basically like he was all of that. You know, he was the answer to all of my problems. And he demanded specifically that he would preach that Sunday night because God told him he was supposed to preach in my church. Here's the thing. I was scheduled to preach that day, and I was the senior pastor. <laughs> so a key sign right there, when someone comes walking through the door with an entourage demanding that they're going to preach in your church, that's already witchcraft, because witchcraft, the Bible says, is like rebellion. Hmm. And so when I had dealt with him and said, absolutely not, you're not going to speak, he not only disrupted my service, he went around behind my back and to all, as many parishioners as possible. We had had a decent-sized church, so it wasn't possible to get to all of them. He went to the parishioners and said all of these things about me that were never true. And later I found out he wasn't even a minister at all. He was actually involved with witchcraft. The second one was this scenario, which is probably the bigger one. I had a situation where I had, her- I had inherited a problem where I was pastoring a church, and um, this specific person was put on staff. They were forced on staff by other people in the church against the previous pastor's will. And this specific individual, they had the reign to do whatever they wanted, how they wanted, and why they wanted. And over the years, they continued to grow more and more rebellious. One specific day, while I was alone with this person talking with them, they actually manifested a demon. Oh, and wow. this person had been on my church staff for a long time. This person manifested a demon right in my office, and I went to actually put my hands on this person and cast it out, and the Holy Spirit said, do not touch this person because they're trying to trap you right now. They're going to say that you you know, physically abused them or something. Oh. So it, it took a long time and a lot of prayer and fasting, but that person eventually ended up getting delivered, and they moved on their way. And so that was very aggressive. You know, two different scenarios there. Someone came in from the outside trying to force their way in. Secondly, someone was already on the inside in a high place. Man, Andy, I wish you were in studio because you should see the faces that my producer and I are making to each other. Our eyes are just so (laughs) wide. We're like, what? How? Yeah. Wow, that's intense. So I want to kind of switch gears a little bit and ask you about a dream, a prophetic dream you had a couple months ago that you actually wrote about online. And for those of you listening, if you want to read that article, just go to witchesinchurch.charismamag.com. So Andy, can you tell me about that warning dream that you had? Uh, Yeah, absolutely. It was around the season where not only was I had, not only did I have that dream, I had several dreams and times where God came to me during that time, and the Lord said, you need to start preparing and warning the body of Christ that witches are on the loose. They're no longer sleeping and just camping out anymore. Uh, There was a time years ago, back in my earlier generation, where kind of witches hung out on one side of the street and churches hung out on the other side of the street, and that day doesn't exist anymore. They're coming over to our camp, and they're getting very, very aggressive. That specific dream talked about two areas. One, how one individual who was a witch was targeting the children, and then they would target the members of the pastoral staff, specifically targeting worship. I've been told many, many times over the years by other pastors that if they ever have a conflict in the church, it's either pastor board, pastor treasurer, or pastor worship leader. Mm -hmm. And the pastors over the years have told me that if it's one of those three conflicts, those are some of the most dangerous because those are the ones that could split and rip the church right down, right down the center. And what Satan wants to do is he wants to split the church in that area, and he wants to cause people in the church to turn their heart away from the pastor. Satan, with witchcraft, is always trying to plant seeds of rebellion, rebellion against authority and rebellion against the leadership. Wow, that's, that's a very good point. So did I want to talk about that pattern that you noticed, how they went after these things. 
did why do you think that he went after the children first? Uh, I thought about that a lot, and I believe that in the dream, they go after the children because the children are most vulnerable. We are taught that we can trust. When we're a young age, we are all taught that we can all sit around a tree some summer evening and play quietly, and we'll get along just fine. And then fast forward to high school, and you have fights getting broke up and everything else. Um, just this past week, uh, at my actual high school where my kids go, uh, there was a fight broke up at a at a actual track meet. And so, you know, they're no longer innocent by the time they get to high school. Um, and so Satan goes after them, and he sends witches after the children to try to curse them and put things on them that they don't have the understanding of how to combat and deal with. So just to clarify real quick, in this dream, you saw a witch come into the church. Are you saying that that symbolized that actual physical witches are infiltrating the church, or are you, are you talking more of a generic spirit of witchcraft? I think it's a combination slightly of both, but I'll get a little aggressive here. I actually think witches, specifically over the last 12 years in America— if you can go back around 12 years with all of the political upheaval and all the things that are happening, I think witches are becoming very, very active, not only to try to go against the government of our nation, but also within the churches. Really? Uh, while we're talking, yes, interestingly, I found out just Monday that one of my distant relatives in another state, they've been playing around with witchcraft lately. So it's very, very real. And you know, just because I'm a minister, it doesn't mean some of my distant relatives are exempt from it. Um, and then this individual's grandmother has been playing around with witchcraft for years. And so Satan will do anything they can to infiltrate the church. And to be very blunt, I believe witches are infiltrating the church right now at a level we have never seen before. Why do you think that is? Because they have lost ground. They have lost some ground in our government in some areas, and the church is starting to learn how to operate in faith. They're starting to learn how to operate in love. The church is starting to also learn how to apply the Word of God into their life, and we are growing. We are growing mm -hmm. as people, and the kingdom is moving with power now. In every way. Uh, I've noticed over the last several years when I get with pastors meetings, as I pray with pastors each week, that the spirit is even moving more powerful in these meetings. And I think that Satan is getting scared. That's a really good point. And now going back to the children, you, you mentioned why the enemy's attacking them because they're vulnerable and they're innocent. But how do we protect them? Uh, I think a, a couple things. Uh, number one, discernment. Um, Faith, hope, and love are the greatest gifts, but I think one of the most powerful weapons in the world right now that a Christian could have, that would be discernment. Learning to really listen to the Holy Spirit. Number one, finding out, does this person really belong on our staff or on our team? And when in doubt, stop and turn the other way. And I think number two, you know, John sixteen thirty three says, I have told you these things so that in me you may have peace. In this world you will have trouble, but take heart, I have overcome the world. It starts with understanding that Christ did all the work. And regardless of how cliche this may sound or old school, I've seen the power when I have screamed in the name of Jesus or by the blood of Jesus, I command you to come out. I've watched demons shrivel. I've watched them shriek. And so it starts with having discernment. Number two, it also starts with applying the blood of Jesus and praying over our young kids and teaching them the Word of God. Because when the Word of God gets in their heart, it's going to be a seed that nothing can take away. That's so good. And I love what you just said about discernment and the Word of God. So how can a pastor, or maybe even just a lay person in general, how does a believer recognize a witch in their church? Uh, I think it comes with a uh, couple things. In building a relationship, you will always discover when a witch or something comes in, it's automatically going to disrupt. Uh, a recent story, actually, there was a church in one of the regions of people that I'm connected with. I don't want to identify the church. But recently, there was a pastor that every time they got behind the podium, 
for a few weeks, they were tongue-tied and they actually couldn't preach. So they went and began to seek it out, and the Lord revealed to them there was a witch that had come into the church. So first and foremost, witches are always going to somehow, whether it's subtle or whether it's bolsterous, they're going to start disrupting. Secondly, you're going to feel it in the environment. Uh, if there's a witch or someone involved with witchcraft that's in one of the board meetings or leadership meetings, oftentimes they're probably going to get somewhat red-faced, and a little bit they're probably going to start getting very perturbed. Anytime we have dealt with someone that's been under the influence of witchcraft or something that's been in the church, give it about two or three weeks, and that stuff will start coming to the surface because they don't walk by the same spirit that we do. I want to point out a scripture that I think really, really helps in this situation. It's Ephesians 6.12. It says, For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms, which means it starts with exposing what's in the spirit realm. Sometimes we can prematurely judge someone and think, oh, they must be a witch because they're always angry. No, they're just angry because they've lost three jobs over the past year. Mm. That's a different story. See the difference? Yeah, that's good. So we've talked about how leaders can kind of guard their churches and guard their flocks. But what about lay people? What if there's a lay person who recognizes that there's witchcraft going on in the church? What should they do? I think a, f- a couple things is I think immediately common sense definitely to the lay person is pray. Um, pray before they report it because you don't want to report on somebody that is innocent. You know, sometimes it is really just the emotion of that person or maybe that person rubs us wrong. But if they really know something's going on, especially if they're involved with children and youth or really in any area, they need to pray first. And then secondly, I think they need to make a personal appointment to the pastor or the leadership team that's over them, because the last thing they should do is go behind that individual's back and trash talk them, because that makes matters even worse. Satan loves to get gossip going in the church. So they need to go to their leader, pray, and then immediately go to their leader. And I would really pray for that person, because the last thing someone wants is to be accused of something that they didn't do. That's a really good point. So I want to kind of take this into a different direction. Can witches in the church, can they look like Christians? I know you mentioned that they get very angry and stuff, but can they can they operate in spiritual gifts? Can they operate in um, the charismata? Uh, absolutely. A uh, little story here. Um, years ago, I was working in a coffee shop ministering to a bunch of homeless people, and a guy came in, and his hand was completely crushed. It was so swollen up, it looked almost like, and I'm exaggerating a little bit, but it almost looked like a soccer ball. It was so swollen up. It was probably more like a a softball would be reality. So it was obvious that this person had a crushed hand. So we called 911, and I was praying for his hand. And there was a homeless person right directly across from me, grabbed his hand and tried to grab my hand. And he started screaming in what sounded like a tongue, like he was praying in the spirit. Well, I immediately could tell something was off with this guy. So I pushed his hand back and I told him to step away for a minute, got the other guy to the hospital. I later found out that this guy not only was demon possessed, he was involved with witchcraft and he had taken it so far. He was actually involved with cannibalism. Oh, oh my goodness. Yep. yep. Wow. And it's the same with the dream, the dream that we had, you had talked about earlier. That's that's at charisma.com there. Um, in the dream, this individual was praying in what sounded like the spirit, but it wasn't the spirit. So yes, they will mask themselves. They will do whatever they can to grab a foothold. But I will say there's one thing, whether they get red faced or not, what I don't <laughs> want is a bunch of people in America looking for red faced people. Cause that would disqual, you know, disqualify most of us would be getting red or yeah. having a bad day. What they need to look for first and foremost is someone that's aggressively moving up the ranks. Witchcraft opens the door for rebellion it opens the door for Absalom. It opens the door for Jezebel. They all love moving behind witchcraft. And what happens is they, uh, someone that's involved with, a witch, uh, with witchcraft, they will typically not want to sit in the pew for three or four years. They will want to get involved somewhere to have some type of authority to get close to the pastor's ear so they could eventually bring them down. That is so fascinating. And it, it just reminds me of 
the enemy, how Satan himself was cast down because he wanted the Lord's position. He he saw the splendor that God had and he grew proud of his own beauty. So that's that's just fascinating to me how, how you draw that parallel in that when witches are, they're looking for that power, they're looking for that seat of authority. Very interesting. Yeah, there's also something else too. Um, I I seem to think in my own opinion that witches oftentimes do not function alone. There's a lot of sayings about the lonely witch. You hear that a lot. But at the same time, I actually think if you see one witch, there's someone else somewhere. So if one witch is moving up in the ranks in the church, there may be some uh, there may be another witch sitting in the pew somewhere. And so eventually they will get exposed. Interesting. Have you ever seen an example of that? Uh, the main example was with the situation I was referring to where I inherited that situation. Mm. Uh, I will also give you another example. When we were overseas on a missions trip, uh, I was a youth pastor then, and we had a day off on this specific mission trip. So we were going into the marketplace. All of us had already ministered for that entire week. We had a blast, had a lot of fun. We weren't, we weren't really thinking of ministry that day. We were going to get a few gifts for our supporters as we as we prepared to travel back the next day. So we were over there overseas and we go into this market and all of a sudden uh, one of my youth kids starts screaming, uh, Pastor Andy, Pastor Andy, Pastor Andy, what's going on here? And there was a witch doctor that came right to our bus and he was standing outside the bus and he was chanting all of this stuff with beads, all these things. And uh, my kids were freaking out. They were scared and uh, they looked at me and not knowing what to do at the time, I just said, okay, everyone off, you know, quit thinking about that guy, and let's just pray for a minute. And this is really, really cool. It talks about how the power of God really works. What I did was I just prayed a very simple prayer. Lord Jesus, protect us right now and drive this evil away. No exaggeration. When I opened my eyes and said amen, that witch literally twirled and ran out of that marketplace. Now watch. That witch had been tormenting all of those people for years. That he had been coming up to these different marketplace areas and saying, if you don't let me have this for you know a smaller amount, I'm going to pronounce a curse on you. When they saw the power of God in us, and we weren't even trying to do anything, there were people that day that got saved in that marketplace because wow. they saw something greater in us than they had ever seen before in that man. So my point is, even though it's not ask, it's not answering the question directly, and I'm aware of that, what comes to mind is that scenario. It is the power of God that moves through a person that sets someone free. And if there's one witch somewhere, there's going to be another one. It was just so happened right around the corner of that marketplace, there was another witch group. And I don't even think that guy was connected with them. It's kind of like that saying, like spirits attract. Interesting. Um, that's how it works. Gotcha. And they, they may not even necessarily know the other is in the area. Correct. Correct. You know, uh, my pastor has done a lot of counseling. He's been at the same church for 30 years now. And one, one time he recently talked about how, um, you know, a man and a woman connect up and they end up having a moral failure, whatever the case. He's had to counsel a few people over the years with that. And he said once, he said, it is absolutely amazing how those like spirits connect with each other. A man meets a woman and they have no attraction to each other, but a year later they have a moral failure. And when you ask them how it happened, they're both looking at each other like, I don't know. I, we just met, we, you know, we met having coffee. That's how Satan works. Like spirits always attract. And do you think that demonic spirits are often behind things like adultery? I do. Uh, specifically, um, I was at a ministry once and a young girl came up to me. She actually manifested, I was talking, and she manifested a demon right in front of me, but she was trying to distract the entire service. So we got her out of the service, and then when the service was over, I was talking with her, and she looked right at me, and she said, my mother pronounces curses. She's a witch, and she pronounces curses over this church every single day. And she looked at me really frustrated, and she said, but she gets very angry. And I looked at her and said, well, why does she get angry? She said, because when she pronounces curses over this church, she said it's like an arrow bouncing back at her, and she can't figure out what it is. Wow. That's the Spirit of God working through our prayers. That's His power creating 
angelic forces around our lives so that no weapon forged against us will ever prosper. That is so good. I love that. I really love that. So how can we be sure that we as Christians are guarding our own hearts and families and people under our care from any possible curses that are coming against us? Because you, you mentioned this witch. She was pronouncing curses every day. You had no idea she was doing that. So even Correct. if we don't see it happening, how can we be careful to guard ourselves on a regular basis? Well, I think there's a couple things there. Um, we we cannot be naive. Uh, number one, we can't think that this world is at war, you know, in other words, spiritual warfare. Uh, so whether we're having good days or bad days, great financial days or bad financial days, good emotional days or not, we have to always remember to start off early in the morning. When I got saved years ago, and I was actually, I was delivered. Did I tell you that? When I became born again, I actually got set free. I, I was delivered. I was I was a very bad person. I was evil. And so I was delivered Praise before, God. You know, when I became born again. And so my pastor, who's an amazing man, taught me when I was a young Christian at 18 years old to seek him first in the morning. So number one, we have to make sure that we seek him first in the morning, regardless of what our emotions are telling us. That doesn't matter. We seek him first. And number two, I've been doing this for years, and some have said, well, Andy, you're old school. But I've seen the power when you speak out that we are covered by the blood of Jesus. I've actually stood overseas and here in the United States before, and I've looked at demons and said, in the name of Jesus, I command you to go. Or I've also said, the blood of Jesus rebuke you. Get out of here. I've watched these demons shrivel. Wow. I've watched demons fly out of body, literally out of bodies. When you mention the power of the blood, so my point is, I actually plead the blood of Jesus every single day over my family, over my kids, my wife, me, our ministry, because I think it's very, very important. And then one thing I've also learned from my pastor over the years is I find scriptures that apply to the situation that I'm dealing with with that day. And I find those scriptures and I speak them out loud. There's something about the spoken word going out in the airways. That's good. That's really good. And now, Andy, we're actually almost out of time for today. But is there anything that you really feel our listeners need to know about this topic before we close? Yeah, a couple of things. I want to leave with a scripture. First John 4, 4. It says, you, you, dear children, are from God and have overcome them because the one who is in you is greater than the one who is in the world. That's the power that we stand on. It's his power through his cross, through the blood of Jesus. And bottom line, what happens is, I think if you discern any form of witchcraft going on, I think you need to tread it very lightly. Mm. Witchcraft is like kicking a hornet's nest. If you don't know what you're doing, get help. You cannot be a lone ranger when you fight witchcraft. You, you can't be rogue either. You know, you have to be very discerning and you have to be in the spirit because it's a spirit to spirit that you're fighting there. Um, you've got to think of witchcraft as a massive hornet's nest and they will sting. And so always be covered, always be in a church, always be connected, regardless of what you go through, connect with the body of Christ and seek advice for people that's over your life before you go dabbling into this stuff and trying to save the day with that type of stuff. Because if you fight witchcraft and you're not ready, it's going to kick your tail. Mm. That's a really good analogy, a hornet's nest. I love that. I mean, I don't love that it's bad, but you know what I mean? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> so, I know. <laughs> Andy, where can our listeners find you on the web? Where can they learn more about you? Uh, they could go to capturingthesupernatural.com. Okay, great. And again, listeners, this was Andy Sanders. He had some amazing insights. If you want to read that article that he wrote, that prophetic dream about witchcraft in the church, again, just go to witchesinchurch.charismamag.com. And as always, be sure to tune in next time to the Charisma News Podcast.